I'm not standing up as Madam Gratitude. I have to make that statement very, very clear. Um, even though I've been, I think, obsessively, hopefully not too obsessively passionate about the um, topic of gratitude, I'm hoping it's a harmonious passion rather than an obsessive passion, but I've been researching this topic for the last 15 years. And um, I've come to understand how much of a giant of a concept gratitude is. And today, as a philosopher of education, rather than as a psychologist, I want to talk to you about how, what this concept looks like in the context of um, education. So, um, in the last, since 1999, there's been a count of the number of um, academic articles that have gone out on the um, role of gratitude, and there's been a count of 600, over 638 academic papers. And of the 638 papers, most of the ways in which gratitude is conceptualized by the scientists and psychologists is as an emotion. Um, any of you who have been to, in, in fortunate enough to have come in touch with Barbara Fredrickson's work, she talks about gratitude as an emotion that causes other, that, that leads to other emotions of a positive kind and that it just has it's this spiralling effect of going around and round and creating more positive emotions and builds a resource of, builds our resources of being really positive. Um, but one of the things that I've come to discover about gratitude is that um, it has its full capacity when it's not just conceptualised as gratitude for being alive or gratitude for being um, a, a, able to teach in a particular school, gratitude for our students. It actually has most of its power when we think about gratitude towards somebody. So I'd like to start with this definition of gratitude as, as conceptualised as an expression towards another. And I'd also like to take it further by talking about gratitude as a practice, because when you put gratitude in the context of education, it becomes very messy and very, very hard, because busy teachers can't conceptualise feeling gratitude all the time. They give up straight away, thinking that if you're thinking about me practising gratitude in the midst of my busy life, forget it. So. Um, the way in which I found into the way in which we can actually practice gratitude in education is through thinking about it as a practice, as an action. Uh, as a teacher educator, I have a wonderful opportunity to teach my students about the role of gratitude. And I'd just like to tell you a story about one of the students that I portray in my book, which I call, who I call Adam Tilford. And Adam Tilford, um, had a class of Year 8 students, and Adam's reputation was spreading right around the world, right around Tasmania, as being a really, really fantastic teacher. And he was used to having really engaged students. And Adam's um, major um, problem when, that he that he hit after three years of teaching was these three girls who were cyberbullying each other. And he did everything he could to actually get them on board and get them engaged and get them to really um, settle in his classes, but he couldn't do anything. Then just out of sheer intuition, he decided to um, just talk to them about, he went around the class and talked to them about what he valued and what he was grateful in each of these students. And he made this statement of gratitude very personal to each one of them, so that um, he said things like, Max, you play really hard, but you keep me on my toes. Chloe, you're a wonderful student, and I really know how much your, your sister has a really bad reputation, but you still turn up for class. Bree, you, you're a um, very interesting student who is very creative. So he made each particular statement particular to that particular student. And he said that as he went around the class, some students started to cry, others turned, around, turned away as if he wouldn't be able to find anything really wonderful in them. And then, as he came to the last student, that student said, OK, Mr. Tilford, we're going to go around and say what we are very grateful to you about. And one after the other, they went around and said to Mr. Tilford things like, Mr. Tilford, um, you, you're so present with us when you teach us. Mr. Tilford, you make us feel so special. Mr. Tilford, you are so... Um, you're the first person in the world, to, first person in my world to have understood me. 
So um, for Adam Tilford, who'd been teaching for three years, that was a really, really special experience. But what was so special about it also was that the cyberbullying that he was trying to um, diminish and was using all the latest policies about cyberbullying to actually diminish actually stopped from that point forward. So it makes me wonder, as a, as a researcher on gratitude, it makes me wonder about all the complexities of education and how much we try and find complex answers to really complex problems, but are we, not really, are we missing the very, very simple answers? Are we making the complex answers too complex? Because gratitude, even though it's very complex, is actually very powerful and, at the same time, very simple. So have we missed, in our looking at the reasons why there's bullying in schools and bullying in the workplace, have we missed the very core reason why people do the bullying in the first place, which is that they don't feel appreciated, they don't feel connected to? And one of the lovely things about this story is that it also emphasises um, that uh, uh, there's a French word for... The French word for gratitude is reconnaissance, and reconnaissance contains the meaning of recognition. So what Adam was doing to his, for his students was he was recognising them, and possibly recognising them in a way that no, no other teacher or no other person in their life had recognised them. And this is the power of gratitude. One of the, the amazing things that has um, occurred in my research project with students is that when they start greeting their students, out of all the practices that they experiment with, when they start greeting their students with pure intention of expressing gratitude to them, that's when their classes start to transform. Once again, a very simple practice. So these teachers are teaching really fancy techniques, all the curriculum, got lots of really good ICT in their classes, but they notice that the students start to settle and start to become more present in their classes once they start recognising them through the simple act of greetings. So my message, if, if one of the many messages I want to give today, is that let's look for simple answers to complex questions in education and let's make them really heartfelt. But let's not oversimplify, oversimplify by only thinking about gratitude as an emotion, because the reason why that worked for Adam was that it was an action. He felt the gratitude towards these students, and he expressed that gratitude through an action. That's when it becomes true gratitude. If, um, the, the lovely example of Sam yesterday, who we're all so moved by, and Sam got up and talked about his story about gratitude. He called his story gratitude. But Sam didn't just feel the gratitude. Sam actually lives his whole life as an expression of gratitude. That is gratitude, expression of gratitude. And the lovely thing about this story about Adam was, is that it's a really lovely example of things that we don't see enough in education, where there is a giving and receiving going on, where the students are actually in a situation where they can give back to the teacher, and the teacher's in a situation where, they, where the teacher can actually receive from their students. And this is where gratitude, which is about giving and receiving a gift, actually comes alive and has the capacity to really enliven the education system, which is at the moment, sadly, I think, quite dead in this giving and receiving um, situation. So how dead it is, is that here are my students, <laughs> and they could be anyone's students, anyone who has, a, has students in the room. They're not just university students, but they're students who might be even sitting at home in an online environment. And one of the things that I've discovered about my students, and I tell them this in the first class and they get really scared, is that they've become really, really good at a very young age at pretending to be present but they're actually, their, mile, their minds are a thousand miles away. I see lots of nods in the, in the audience, which is really good. <laughs> and maybe that's you right now as you're listening to my presentation. <laughs> but I also say to my students that I can tell the difference when, they, um, when they're awake. I have this whole notion of an awake student. 
and I, and I don't settle for any mediocre levels of awakeness. And I think in education, we have really settled for this ability. We just, we know that they're dead. We know that they're just sitting there. We know that their mind's a thousand miles away, but we just keep teaching and keep pouring stuff into them. And that's a real problem. And um, so what I say to my students is that I know that there's, that, 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 um, there's something there for them to actually aim for, which is this awakeness. And I also know that um, this, this deadness inside them is not necessarily their fault because it's the way in which we've constructed education where um, the student is positioned, they're entrenched in this receiving mode and, and, and teachers are entrenched in giving mode so that students are... And, and, and the more, in which, the more um, ways in which we're entrenching them in terms of full fee-paying students and calling them clients and all this crazy discourse about education, of education being this commodity that we sell to clients, it's no wonder that the students are actually becoming more and more entrenched as these receivers. So um, my whole kind of, um, my whole passion for education comes from this quality of awakeness that I want in my students. And the philosopher Martin Heidegger has done some fabulous work on this notion of presence. And he says that um, we haven't yet truly learned how to think as human beings because we haven't, let, we haven't yet truly learned how to be present in the learning process. And he also draws our attention to a wonderful etymological link between thinking and thanking. And when I saw that, I raced down to the University of Tasmania Library and got this etymological dictionary out and brushed off the covers. It was last taken out in 1963. It was a 1958 version, so you can smell the smells of this etymological dictionary. And I was so excited because, indeed, thinking and thanking come from the same word, which is thonk. So <laughs> that's why... It, that's why in, 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 um, in, in, the, in the German language we have um, Denker and Danker, and in other Scandinavian languages you find the, the connections. So I'm taking both the literal and the metaphorical um, from this and making it really big in my work, saying that when students think while they think, they think better. When students think while they think, they think in a deeper way. And that's what my research is showing as well. So when students come into the classes and they're taught how to be present, because all students are thirsty to know how to be engaged, that's the number one premise I start with, the more that they start to take up practices of gratitude where they come into the class with an awareness of, of what they've been given and wanting to give back in some way, some individual way, then they start to think at a deeper level. We see this... Um, um, exemplified in, for example, mature A students who haven't ha been able to have an education for a really long time because they've been at home with their kids or working and all of a sudden they go to study and you can't stop the awakeness. They're just sort of beaming with awakeness. Or refugee students whose lives might have been snapped away, whose lives have been nearly snapped away. Their awakeness when they're in their classroom because they're so appreciative of the ability to study. This whole thinking and thanking is very evident everywhere. So um, one, of the, one of the areas where, where gratitude has its most power is when we look at the opposite of gratitude. And a philosopher called Robert Roberts, and I'm sorry that his mother thought of the name Robert when his last name was Roberts. I can't work that one out. But anyway, Robert Roberts... Um, has done some brilliant conceptual work and he's shown that the word gratitude is symmetrically opposite to the word resentment. So where there is resentment, gratitude can't live, and where there is gratitude, resentment can't live. Isn't that fantastic? So the way in which educators can understand gratitude is to see it as a way out of their resentment. Now, it's really important that we don't see this in a simplistic way because it's not about replacing resentment with gratitude because that's just putting a positive veneer over a negative situation. That's just going to be... That's crazy-making. What, what I am saying here is that taking one step away from resentment is a gratitude practice in itself and is of the most powerful kind. 
So just naming the resentment or taking responsibility for it or recognizing it in its form and then making, taking action to do something about it is a gratitude practice. So gratitude practices aren't just about smiling more or being really loving and kind and, and, and all that sort of thing. They're fantastic. But for teachers who are working in really, really difficult environments, this is the kind of stuff that really speaks to them. So um, one of the things about students' um, inability to be awake in our classes is that they come into our classes quite full of this resentment because of being in the position of being receiving. When you want to receive, you're expecting a lot, and when you're not getting what you expect, you start to complain, don't you? And if you're, a ser if you're being provided a service, that's even worse. So, um, if we want students to be thinking, thanking while they're thinking and awake in our classes, we need to actually educate them out of resentment and to help them recognise what that resentment's doing to their thinking process. And I have to tell you that most students that I've been teaching for many years are really thirsty to know this process. And yet, the most powerful way in which we can help students change their attitude of complaint and resentment is to focus on our own as teachers, as educators, as parents, our own resentment and our own complaint and dissatisfaction. And so what, what's flowing down to the students is not just our, our education or our, our, um, our skills. What's flowing to them more than anything is our attitude. And we see this in schools that have brilliant um, principles, which that principal just emulated then. When we have schools where princi principals really are attentive their, to their resentment and attentive to their gratitude, that how the schools are completely transformed by that one, teach, what, that one principle. So what my, my hypothesis is that the um, teacher's innermost attitude flows to the student's innermost attitude. And if you want to change... Um, education, and if you want students to be awake, to be thanking while they're thinking, sometimes it's, it's, it's enough just to concentrate on the teacher's innermost attitude, and in, in particular the school leader's innermost attitude. That's enough. So when I go and do work in schools, I only ever do work if the school leaders and the teachers are willing to do the work first, because sometimes that's just transformative. And why I call this approach a radical view, that's, that's um, sort of probably quite evident. But um, I call it a radical view because there's not much of this in education. I call it a radical view because we are crippled by the malaise of complaint in education. We haven't recognised the impact of that complaint and how much it's flowing down to education and our students and crippling their ability to be present in our classes by the complaint of the upstream of the river. And I call it a radical view because one of the teachers, one of the many teachers that I have worked with who have taken up gratitude practices in one, one, in one um, recent research project in Western, northern Western Australia, one teacher decided just to concentrate on one student who hadn't been coming to class. She was a year 11 student and she just focused all her gratitude on this student. So looked for the gifts that she saw in this one student. And that student, after about a week, started to be more engaged, more present in the classes, came to class. And she said to this teacher, you're the first teacher ever who's ever thanked me. This is a year 11 student. So you'd think that teachers express gratitude to their students all the time, teachers greet their students all the time, teachers thank their students all the time. Well, I'm here to tell you today, from my research, that's not happening. And with the, all the emphasis on curriculum and busyness and performance objectives and ICT, we're missing really, really, really powerful, simple daily practices that I think once we have them, we can transform education. And I'm not saying that gratitude is the panacea for all the answers of the problems in education, but coming back to the example of Adam, and the transformation in his classes, I think there's a message there for us as educators about the power of gratitude. So thank you very much.